Our guest today is Camilla batman -Gellage. She's founder and director of Kids Company, a charity working in South London with lone children. It's been going for 11 years now and has dealt with over 12,000 young people. Camilla is a champion of those children that many other parts of society have given up on. Camilla, welcome. And can I just talk about your own background to begin mm. with? Because that's interesting. You are Iranian by birth, born into a fairly wealthy family. Just talk a little bit about, about that. Uh, I, w I was growing up in Iran, and my experience of childhood was that I had two police bodyguards. And then I ended up at a public school in Britain, and the Iranian Revolution happened whilst I was at school. And I was left here with no status and no mm. money. My father was taken as a prisoner in Iran, and I had to get political asylum and basically work in nurseries to try and raise money during the holidays. Did so your family could, join you though, if, or were you by yourself for I, a I few years? I was by myself for a while. My mother eventually, who happened to be in France, joined me. And my father was kept as a prisoner uh, in the main prison in Iran, because they just collected all mm. the intellectuals and the wealthy. I suppose that means, especially given it was boarding school and your family weren't with you, that for you, school played a huge part in your childhood and in your upbringing. Yes, but also I struggled at school. I found it very, very difficult. You are severely dyslexic. Very. Was, was that part of the reason you struggled? It was, um, it was very, very hard, because by the time I was 14, I was speaking three languages fluently. Mm but couldn't really write in any of them. Mm. My mother generously contributed to my common entrance paper. Mm. And uh, when I got to the public school, very quickly, they uh, realized there was something wrong. So I was definitely in the bottom set. Yeah. But how did that make you feel about, you, about yourself, about your own ability? I thought that I was very thick. Mm. Was that what people told you? Uh, well, I couldn't understand. You know, I lived in this very discrepant world because mm. I was intellectually very advanced. Mm. And, you know, at, by 12, I was interested in Burton Russell. I was mm. interested in Jung. But it, I, I was sitting in a class where I thought, if they describe another tree in this book, I'm going to commit suicide. Mm. And the frustration I felt at not being able to read the print not to write, uh, I hated, you know, all the textbooks, couldn't take anything in. I mean, you did actually end up going to work at university, but was there a time when you felt like dropping out of education and well, felt it wasn't for what you? what happened to me, I was very lucky. A neurologist, when I was 16, assessed me at Queen's Hospital in London and made the examining boards allow me to do everything on tape recorder. So in fact, I've got four A-levels on tape, and Warwick University was the only university yes. that would give me a place. Credit to Warwick for Yeah, them. absolutely. Because mm. everywhere else turned me down because they thought I wouldn't academically achieve. And Warwick allowed me to use a tape recorder. Did you do your degree by a uh, sort of tape recorder? My entire degree, I've got a first class degree, it's all on tape. Mm. So all the exams, all the papers were all done on tape. And then subsequently, it was the same for my psychotherapy training. That's all on tape. Mm. So a whole door opened. Um, not many uh, people at 20-odd then went and set up a charity to, mm. to help um, children who'd not had the same advantage as you had. Well, the first charity I set up when I was 25 is called The Place to Be, which offers... Which still runs. Yeah. It offers therapeutic and counselling support to children in schools, and it's national. Then, uh, in my early 30s, I set up Kids Company because I became very interested in children who were worried about the holidays coming about mm. and very anxious that school wouldn't be there as a kind of security for them. Mm. And I wanted to set up a provision that was looking after children during the holidays. But what happened is we were in some railway arches in Camberwell and basically 100 adolescent boys arrived mm. en masse. Mm initially to destroy the place. Mm. So they used to light um, cushions and roll their spliffs up and get their knives out and rip the whole thing up. And we were out of our depth. Mm. Do you remember you learned from that experience I, that there was a need there? Kids Company definitely evolved because of what children were telling us. We have two street level centers, 
One is an academy for education Which we'll talk for about young people. Later and on. the other is a multidisciplinary centre that functions in a parenting capacity mm. in the lives of children where there isn't a functioning parent around. And when do they come? Do they still come during the holidays or after school? Do you have some children all day? They, they come all day. So what happened after that 100, another 100 arrived. And basically, we've ended up with 900 children at this street level center. And some of them have been with us for years. In fact, in October, we drove a group up to university yes. who'd arrived as children drug dealing. Yes. and in prostitution. The kind of child that arrives at Kids Company Center, the Arches, uh, is a child who doesn't have a functioning parent in their lives. The parent may be an addict mm. or have mental health problems. What age children are you talking about? When I first started, it used to be 13 and 14 year olds. Now we're seeing them at 10. Mm. Uh, and we're seeing kids who are recruited by drug dealers to actually mule, carry drugs between dealers. Yeah. And they're threatened. You know, boys, you know, 11, 12, 13 year old boys are arriving, describing the barrel of a gun put down their throat mm. and threatened. Mm. Even, you know, people pull the trigger, but there's just no, no bullet, bullet in inside. Mm. Yeah. And how did you switch it from being a place where 100 young boys turn up and want to burn it down to being a place where? thousands of children turn up and see it as a sanctuary. Because I discovered that the thing that was missing the most in these children's lives was love and loving care. And I know this culture is very ashamed of talking about mm. love openly, but actually what these children were suffering from is that they had no attachment figure in mm. their lives. And because they were so abandoned, so neglected and so abused, they'd shut down their capacities to feel. Mm. So they were walking around kind of lethally cold, emotionally numb, capable of great harm. And because no one was treasuring them and no one looked forward to greeting them they every day. They weren't special to anyone. Yeah, they, they, had, they felt that there was no point to living. Mm. But know? how did you make the breakthrough with them? Because these are deeply damaged young people. I began interviewing them individually on their own when I learnt the street language and how it all works. Did you go out into the street or have you all uh, depended they, on them they coming to you? They all came. They poured in. Mm. Word of mouth spread. And they were pouring in and we were offering two meals a day. So, you know, lunchtime you'd expect at least a hundred. Yes. Dinner, some 200 kids would pour in. And then one by one I would take these kids and spend hours piecing their life stories together. Mm. I've now written 400 of their life stories mm. in my own archives. And that's when I discovered that actually there is no such thing as a criminal child. Uh, these children are so chronically abused mm. and neglected that they're pushed towards criminality as a way of surviving. Mm. What about mental health as well? A lot of the uh, material I've read about your center, there is this emphasis on mental health and I think as a society we're not good at picking up signs of mental health issues in children. Is that an issue that it's a very you come big across? problem. A third of the kids who come to our centres have significant mental health difficulties. They have psychosis because of their skunk use and they use street drugs to self medicate. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, crack cocaine stops flashbacks of abuse. And these children, when they withdraw from crack, they begin to have night terrors and flashbacks. Mm. So that, and they can't sustain the withdrawal, they go back on it. Mm. And again, you know, things like skunk and cannabis gives them a sense of control over brain chemistry that feels out of control. Mm. So it's their way of taking control of their own lives Absolutely. in a way. Absolutely. They don't take drugs as a leisure function. They're taking it to self-medicate. Mm. Be, be clear about this. Where do the children go home at night to? Where do they go back to sleep? Sixty-eight percent of the children are homeless when they arrive. So they're in local authority care? Well, not, or no, should be. no, should be. And this is one of the problems. In this country at the moment, there are some 550 to 570,000 children referred to child protection. Mm. We're only able to take about 37,200 on the Child Protection Register. Mm. So there's some 500,000 plus children left outside the doors of social services. 
And this is the hidden statistic. Mm. Mm. So what happens to these kids is they end up on people's floors. I've walked into schools. And these are children under 16, these yeah, are some le are under children, 16. legally children. Absolutely. Yeah. Is it just capacity or sometimes is it the attitude of those people who are in the system, in social services, who are meant to be dealing with these children? Why does it go so badly wrong for so many youngsters? I think that it's two things. It's underfunding and it's a lack of a theory of mind. So long as this society believes that one set of children are simply morally flawed and they make poor moral choices and therefore they are described as the criminals and the rest of society is morally intact and should be protected against these bad children. Mm. We are thinking about it the wrong way. The truth is that it's adult irresponsibility, lack of adult investment, lack of prioritizing child protection, mm. which is making children have to resort to savage and dangerous mm. ways of surviving. I suppose what you seem to be saying is people who work in child protection should have backgrounds in health, in uh, psychotherapy or in support. I mean, if we got Absolutely. the wrong skill set in the bit of our society that's meant to be looking after these children. I think we've got the wrong skill set. They're very dedicated social workers on the ground, but because they can't see themselves as resolving these children's difficulties because they're so under-resourced, yes. The workers shut down their feeling repertoire a bit like the children to survive. Yeah. So a child who's seeking compassion and kindness is coming across a worker who's also emotionally dead and exhausted. The whole structure needs an mm -hmm. um, overhaul. I mean, I shouldn't be, as an agency, kids company, taking That's right. social services and mental health to court Mm. to judicial review. In one year I took them 34 times, won every single case. I take the point about capacity, but it, has, it does have to be more than that. I mean, they've got a far greater budget than you've got. So it's more, of, it's more than money, isn't it? It's our whole, it is our approach it's as a society in, to how we're dealing with these children. It's our approach. And I think the biggest barrier to educational attainment is not the quality of the teaching in the classroom. I think the quality of the teaching in the classrooms are actually really very high. It's the psychosocial conditions yeah. with which the pupil enters the school. You know, and we now know from brain research that if you've been neglected and you've been chronically traumatized, you find it very difficult to calm yourself down mm -hmm. and to make room for learning to go in. Too much so on your mind. There's too much on your mind. And not only that, you are hyper agitated. There's too much adrenaline in your system, mm. too many stress chemicals. So you have a constant need for movement mm. in a situation where people are telling you to sit down all sit the down time. Sit down and sit still. Sit yeah. down, sit still and be quiet. S yeah. Do you do any work with families? Because I, I suppose there's a line of argument that says if you could solve the problem at family level, you wouldn't actually need either social services or you to intervene. Our first port of call is to do a home visit and find out what condition the child is living in and identify if there might be a carer in the child's life who could be strengthened to parent that child. And to give you an example, recently we found um, some children under the age of 11, three children with two drug addicted mm -hmm. parents and we identified the grandmother as someone who could be helped by our staff to take care of the children. And we've managed to push for both parents to go to rehab. Right. So we will try that. But the truth is mm. that, you know, we have some 800 children with us on Christmas Day. Yeah. Do you find that if you can keep the child in their own home and give them support there, it turns out better in the end than taking them out of it's it? It's a much better model. And, you know, if you look at the kids' company model, our centre is open six days a week. We have two emergency houses. Children can come into our centre any time they want to for anything they want. We have a doctor, a nurse, nine teachers. If you need to fill in a form, if you need a pair of socks, if mm. you've got a tooth abscess, whatever it is, you can just walk in. One stop shop. And we'll help sense. you immediately. Yes. It's a much more effective use of resource than a social worker having to make an appointment to visit the house and have two security men with her so that she doesn't get attacked on the estate. You know, the models under which we're operating are really flawed. Mm, mm. And the center can act as a kind of parenting capacity mm. to strengthen the biological parent 
or to supplement mm. it. So substitute Absolutely. family early. How many of the children you deal with are actually registered on a, with a mainstream school and go most days? The children who come to our street level centres um, arrive, sort of some 60% of them arrive out of education. So we're having to try and find uh, educational provisions for them and get them back in. They're not even on anyone's register. You know there's a word called ghosting. Yes. Uh, and basically what ghosting means is you get rid of a child but you don't show it on any paper anywhere, you yeah. know. And I understand, you know, quite frankly, if I was a teacher with 30 children in a class and I had two or three of these completely dysregulated, mm. aggressive, challenging kids, I think I would really struggle mm. because the, what we also know from brain research is that these children can alter the ability of other children to calm down mm. by virtue mm. of just you know manipulating the energy that's right. field. That's right. I mean, I, that was my own experience when Absolutely. I was teaching. That if, two, if two children were away, the other 28 would be a completely different social group. But that same argument is there. I mean, it, equally, if you understand why some teachers find that they can't cope with them, you also have some sympathy with perhaps elderly people or law-abiding families who just find their presence in their neighbourhood too much to bear. Do you know what? I agree that the presence of very disturbed children is very challenging. Where I differ with the current debate is that you can solve this problem immediately by putting an adult next to that child mm. who can act as an attachment figure. So I would say understaffing in classrooms is much more of a challenge and a problem than the disturbed child. Mm. I would put it the other way around. But with proper support, many, most of your children should be able to cope with mainstream school? Absolutely, and you know, also um, in one primary school at the moment, we're piloting a project where we're taking the most challenging and disturbed children and giving them 20 minute exercise breaks. So, and in that way, we're basically helping them regulate their energy functioning and the early results are good. really, really good. So let's go on to that. So the, you work with 33 schools at the moment who've approached you and, mm -hmm. if you like, uh, partly buying your services and then you top it up with a lot of, of your own money. So when you go to school, what, what do you add to what's already there on the premises? What we do when we go into a school um, is that we do a full audit of need. So we'll speak to the dinner ladies, the premises officer, the teachers. We'll have a good sense of what the difficulties are in that school. And then we create therapy rooms which are fully equipped with toys and art materials. We go to assembly and speak to the children and allow the children to self-refer to our services. And the services that are being offered in each school is that there's a fully qualified psychotherapist on the premises for at least three days a week. Right. And that person is the team leader. Around the team leader, we'll build up a team of 20 workers who are social workers, trainee psychotherapists, artists, musicians, alternative health workers. So we will have an unbelievable resource base of some 20 workers who are brought into the school. Mm -hmm. And then the kids self-refer and they can go to an art club, or they can go to one-to-one -one therapy, or they can go to stop bullying, or we run leadership uh, programs where year fives are providing mm. clubs for year twos, and we train year fives in leadership. So it's a very creative, mm. Mm. emotional well-being program But presumably, schools. presumably the school has to be prepared for this almost, because it's quite a change to what they do. The negative behavior of the children goes down, so teachers are a bit relieved that they've got the support mm. that they've always wanted. Because what I, I've seen is teachers want the very best for the children, they do, but yeah. they don't have the resource. Yeah. So when a resource comes in and does the bit that they are unable to do at the time, you know, they feel strengthened. What about those that aren't on anyone's register? Um, what, once they've turned up with you, we, we, to some extent society knows about them and you can't then ghost them. You can't pretend that they're at school when they're not. Where do they end up being educated? We've got some of the schools that we work with therapeutically have deals with us where, for example, if we find a child on the street who hasn't been in education, those schools will take them for us. 
and we chase local education authorities to try and get kids back yes. into the system. The difficulty is the 16 pluses, because those who are of school leaving age arrive, but they can't read and write, and they can't access college because they're emotionally and behaviorally mm. so immature still. And that's why we ended up creating our urban academy where teachers, therapists, and alternative health practitioners work together with the students. So the timetable is done that the child can have one massage, can go mm. to a lesson, and can have their housing issue addressed, and can have them. psychotherapy. And is that for those over 16? Is that for those under over 16, 16 as well? For our under 16s, in our urban academy, there's a pupil referral unit. Right. Is and that funded by the local authority? Some local authorities are buying places there, and we have an 85% reintegration rate back into that's mainstream. That's good. Yeah, which that, is that's really much good. higher than is normally it the is, case. It is, because it's 34 normally. Yeah. yeah. Looking slightly from the outside, I think there's been an attempt to bring more bodies, more adults into the school. There are mentors, there are more classroom assistants to deal with children. So. It worries me a, a little bit that some schools have still not got this right. Is it a case of us not having sufficient of these extra adults in school to work with children? Or have we not actually targeted, again, the right set of skills that some children need? I think the right set of skills and the thinking, the lack of right kind of thinking, is the point. For example, for the child who is physiologically dysregulated and disorganised, yeah behavior modification isn't working because what they need is someone to bring down their chemical arousal levels mm. through an attachment relationship. But people don't understand why one method works with one child yes. and why another doesn't because there isn't a sophisticated enough thinking amongst the workforce because of the way they're being trained. Now, all the literature and the science of this is available in neuropsychiatry. And it's new research, this is a new area, isn't very it? Very new area of research, but very robust area of research. But all the knowledge is still in clinics, mm. and it's not filtering down to the workforce. Mm. So the workforce is not benefiting from the science, and it's still stuck in a kind of pseudo-Christian morality way mm. of handling very disturbed children. Mm. It's interesting that you say, despite all your children's experiences, that schools are, are still an institution where this support should happen. And I think that's important because with moving mm. to extended day and extended services, I mean, you've not given up, if you like, have you, on schools as institutions being not potentially part of, the, part of the solution. But you know, the interesting thing is that actually the most competent people in the schools might be the magical dinner lady. Yes. But can got someone with the explain child. why this particular dinner lady happens to be so brilliant with yeah. the most disturbed children? That is the yeah. intellectual property yeah. that needs to be made visible. We need to dare to say that actually attachment, love and mm. compassion might be better tools of control than mm. punishment and sanctions. Mm. That leads us into something I did want to raise with you. I, I suppose some of the children who you're talking about might be in gangs because it might be part of the security that they lack elsewhere in their life. If you're not naturally a violent child, you better join a gang mm. and have the protection, protection of other of children mm. and create the myth mm. of danger and lethalness and take pictures with firearms mm. and that kind of thing. The whole point of all this is that it's two sets of children wanting safety, but mm. because they believe adults are incapable of providing safety for them, they've managed a system that perversely, through violence, ensures safety. And mm. that is the issue. So we've got mm. to, as a society, take responsibility for reducing mm. violence. It's interesting, you said you raised uh, 40 million pound for kids' company so far. And I know that you, you've still got money to raise. There's real threats over the organisation about funding for next year. You know, should you be mainstream? Should the state, the local authorities, should they be doing what you're doing? Or is part of the attraction of your organisation for kids is that you're not the state, you're not the system? The state is still thinking about outcomes and solutions that can be captured by computers. Yeah. Until we put affection 
and love at the center of our interventions, we're not going to reach these children whose fundamental crisis is emotional. That's number one. In terms of whether we should be within the statutory sector or independent, we could be and should be within the statutory sector provided the standard isn't going to get compromised. Yeah. And the beauty of a kids' company agency at street level is that when a statutory organization doesn't honor its care to a vulnerable child, we can take that statutory agency to judicial review on behalf of that child. If I was employed by the local authority, I'd be threatened with withdrawal and of And you funding. wouldn't want to trade that even for statutory funding, which would make you financially never. more secure. I will never trade anything that is going to compromise the quality mm. of the service. Mm. And I think, finally, do you remain an, an optimist about the state of our country, about this generation of children who will eventually become the generation of adults? I, I'm hugely optimistic because 40 million that I've raised is a measure of the compassion and the kindness of complete strangers. So that's a measure of the compassion that's out there in the general public. I think my job is to strengthen that kind of thinking by changing the debate in the media and by making the information available to the public so that they understand the duty left to the adults of mm. this country is one of child protection, not one of locking up children. Camilla, thank you for what you do and thank you for being with us today. Thank you.